Welcome to Chapter 5. I'm Jim Burnham. Today we're talking about atomic structure and the periodic table. The first guy to come up with the idea of the atomic theory was a Greek philosopher around 400 BC named Democritus. And he basically theorized that if you cut something again and again and again and again, you must finally come to something that uh, is some fundamental particle that can no longer be cut. So if you took water and just divided it and divided it and divided it, at some point you'd come to an uncuttable piece of water or a piece of rock or something. So his idea of the atom was some small hard particle that um, was, was the fundamental particle. And it was a pretty good theory. Again, he didn't do any experiments, but he theorized that this had to be the case. Some sort of fundamental Lego out of which everything else is built. Well, this was revived by an English school teacher named Dalton, and it became the modern day atomic theory. And Dalton's atomic theory basically had several parts, but it, he started with the same idea of Democritus that all the elements were composed of tiny indivisible particles. And so he used the Greek name for uncuttable uh, atomos, atoms. He thought of them as solid spheres, like little marbles or little bowling balls. And he, uh, he theorized that every element had a different atom, and that's what made it different. And that all of the elements of one, all the atoms of one particular element, though, were all identical to each other. So all of the the atoms of helium, for example, would be the same, and all the elements of carbon would be the same, but they'd be different from each other. The fourth thing is that all chemical change is simply the rearrangement of atoms. Atoms aren't transformed or changed from one kind of atom to another kind of atom. The atoms stay exactly what they are. They're simply rearranged, and that rearrangement is what explains chemical change. So three big points to Dalton's atomic theory. Atoms are indivisible, and all elements are made of these fundamental building blocks. Different elements have different atoms, and all chemical reactions are the result of atoms being rearranged. So now we look at the structure of the atom, because it turns out that Dalton wasn't right about the atom being indivisible. It turns out it is divisible into three main subparticles, subatomic particles. This is a particle accelerator. You slam these together, these particles, you get all kinds of subatomic particles. And we can break them down even lower than that. But for our purposes, we are looking at three basic subatomic particles, the electron, the proton, and the neutron. We're going to talk about how they were discovered, what smart guys uh, did to discover these things. The first of the subatomic particles to be discovered was the electron. Now, the electron is a negatively charged particle within the atom. It was discovered by English physicist J.J. Thompson, uh, in 1897, he was looking at basically a, a carnival novelty uh, known as a cathode ray. And this was something that people were excited about and made pretty colors and made a great uh, uh, display. And it was, it was gas inside a tube. And it was connected to a positive and a negative wire. And what happened was is that when you connected it, a stream of, of light seemed to appear between the, the metal, uh, the metal rays, the metal, the metal uh, ends, and so this was known as a cathode ray, and it's actually the technology behind the television set. Well, Thompson looked at this, and he said, "I think there's something going on here." He noticed that cathode rays were attracted to positive magnets, and that they were repelled by negative magnets. So if you held the negative part of a magnet, it would push this cathode ray away, but the positive side would, would attract it upward. And so he proposed that cathode rays were streams of negatively charged particles moving at high speed. The reason that they were negatively charged, that would explain why they would be attracted to a positive pole of a magnet and repelled by the, the negative pole. Here's his idea. They just, it's, it's, 
is made up of a stream of negatively charged particles, and he decided to call them electrons. He noticed that the cathode ray didn't depend on the kind of gas that was used. It didn't depend on the kind of metal used for the electrodes on each end. And so Thomson concluded that this must be a property of all atoms. All atoms must have electrons. It does not nothing in particular to the gas or the metal. So then another scientist comes along, an American this time, Robert Millikan, and he performed his famous oil drop experiment in 1916. And with this experiment, he took oil droplets as tiny as he could make them. Uh, they would get a charge on them, and then he would he would try to he would suspend them between a positive and a negative plate to calculate the amount of charge it would take to counterbalance the charge on the oil. And what he found out is that no matter what size the drop, all the oil drops had charges which were multiples of this fundamental number. Um, and so he decided, you know what, that must be the charge of an electron. This fundamental unit of, of electricity must be the, the charge of an electron because they, it's always some multiple of that unit. And he also calculated the mass of an electron. And it turned out to be 1 uh, 840th of the mass of hydrogen. So basically 1 2,000th of the weight of hydrogen. And this takes us to protons. We define protons as positively charged particles. And this sort of makes sense because if cathode rays are electrons streaming away from atoms, you have to ask yourself, what's left behind when that negatively charged particle goes away? What happens, for example, when hydrogen, the lightest element, loses an electron? What's left behind? We understand now that it's a proton. But think about it. What do we know? We know atoms are electrically neutral. And if the electric charge, if a negative electric charge is carried away by a particle of matter known as the electron, and we don't have fractional charges, as Millikan showed, the negative charges are all whole number of multiples of a basic unit, then those negative particles must be counterbalanced by a positive particle. And, 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 that's, how, and you, that's, the, that's the only way you can get a neutral atom. There must be something of like charge that counterbalances the electron's negative charge. So there must be a particle with a unit of positive charge. And, and so now, now is, you know, can we discover this? And a guy named Goldstein did just that. What he found is that uh, unlike cathode rays, which moved in this direction toward a positive electrode, he found that uh, under certain conditions, he could get rays moving in the opposite direction moving through the canals that the pierces of a cathode, a negatively charged um, disk. And, and so he said these must be positively charged particles. So this was in 1886. And he found he could get them to fluoresce on the opposite side. So he called them canal rays and concluded they must be positive particles. And so that became the definition of proton. Let's call them protons. And every proton has the mass 1840 times that of an electron, which is essentially the mass of hydrogen, because hydrogen is a single proton once you take away that one electron. A few years later, in 1932, James Chadwick confirmed the existence of neutrons, the third subatomic particle, because it was known that the atom had more mass than could be accounted for by either the mass of the electron, which was very, very small, and the mass of the proton. There must be something else, some other particle that helped give it mass. So they theorized that it had to be something, uh, some neutrally charged particle called a neutron. But it was Chadwick who won the Nobel Prize for discovering, for confirming the existence of and so we define the neutron as the subatomic particle with no charge, has no positive or negative charge, but it has a mass essentially equal to that of a proton. So now we get to 
how are all these particles put together? What is the structure of the atom now that we know that it has more than one piece? Now that we, more than, we know it's more than just a, a, a bowling ball. So Thompson, the discoverer of the electron, came up with what is known as the plum pudding model. If you don't know what plum pudding is, just imagine this is just a muffin, a, 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 a raisin muffin or a blueberry muffin. So the blueberry do the, the, the blueberries would be like the, the negative electrons that could be made to stream away from the rest of the dough. And, uh, and the rest of the dough would have a, a, a positive charge throughout that would counterbalance the negative charges of the individual uh, blueberry electrons. So this was the plum pudding model. In 1911, a guy named Rutherford put the plum pudding model of Thompson to the test. And he performed what is known as the gold foil experiment. He shot these positively charged alpha particles that by comparison with the gold foil, these are super massive particles moving at very high speed. And he expected if Thompson's plum pudding model were correct, that those fast moving positive particles would punch through the plum pudding, punch right through the blueberry muffins with no interference. But he found, so this was what he expected to happen, right? If it's a plum pudding, these alpha particles would just pierce right through them, essentially undeflected, unchanged in their motion. And all of the particles would end up being uh, right here in, you know, in the detector uh, in, in, in an exact path of the, of the stream, of the incoming stream. But what he found out is that while most of them went through undetected and deflected, undeflected, some of them were wildly deflected and some even bounced st almost straight back toward the stream um, where it began. And this was highly unanticipated because again he thought it was going to sail right through but once in a while it would bounce not just a little a lot rutherford described it like a howitzer shell bouncing off a piece of tissue paper it was as unexpected as if you fired a cannon at uh you know like a, a, a toilet paper that somehow the cannonball would bounce back and so he had to say, you know what, Thompson's model of the plum pudding, his idea of how these subatomic particles are put together is wrong. The nucleus must be small, it must be very, very dense, and it must be positively charged, because only that could account for how that fast-moving, positively charged alpha particle could bang into it and bounce at such wild, uh, wild angles. So we have a new theory. The atom must be mostly empty space. That all the positive charge and almost all of the mass of an atom is located in a small, dense region known as the nucleus. So this, the nucleus, this is the tiny central core of an atom composed of the protons and neutrons, which hadn't been discovered yet. But once they were, they knew they had to also be in that tiny, dense, positively charged core known as the nucleus. And so here is a rendition of this. And of course, this is not at all to scale, as we're going to see in a second. But here is the nucleus surrounded by a swirling orbital cloud of electrons. And the nucleus is incredibly small compared to the size of the atom. If the whole atom were the size of a football stadium, the nucleus would be the size of a marble on the 50-yard line. So if you're keeping track, here are the discoveries. Thompson discovered the electron with his cathode ray. Millikan discovered the charge and the mass of electrons with his oil drop experiment. Goldstein discovered positive particles, protons, in his canal ray experiment. Chadwick confirmed the existence of neutrons, and Rutherford discovered the nucleus, the tiny central core of the atom. And so this is the modern day understanding of the atomic structure that 
in that nucleus, you have the neutrons and the protons packed in a very dense, small core, surrounded by a vast cloud of fast-moving electrons that are very, very far away from the nucleus, as far away as you know the walls of the stadium are from the, from the, uh, the marble on the 50-yard line. That takes us to atomic number. If you look at the periodic table, or you see an element listed, you'll often see it listed like this. It'll have the symbol for the element, the name of the element. And then up here in one of the corners, it will have what's known as the atomic number. Also down here, it will have what's known as the atomic mass. We'll get to both of those. But what makes atoms different from each other? It's the number of protons that an atom has. The, the identity of an atom is determined by the number of protons it possesses. And that number of protons we keep track of with the atomic number. So the atomic number is equal to the number of protons, and it gives every element its essential identity. So remember, atoms are electrically neutral. Therefore, the number of protons, the positively charged particles, which give the atom its identity, is equal also to the number of electrons that balance out that positive charge and make the atom electrically neutral. Therefore, the atomic number not only gives you the number of protons, it's a two-for-one special, you also get the number of electrons because electrons equal protons. So these three things are always equal. If you know the atomic number, you know the number of protons, you also know the number of electrons. Here are the atoms of the first 10 elements. And as you can see, here's atomic number one. How many protons? One. How many electrons? One. Here's atomic number two. How many protons? Two. How many electrons? Two. You'll see it's all it's the same. Five, five, 10, 10. Okay. Atomic number equals proton number equals electron number. We'll talk about neutrons and how it affects mass number in just a minute. Okay, sample problem. The element nitrogen has an atomic number of seven. How many protons does it have? How many electrons does it have in a neutral atom? Well, this is simple. You don't even have to do the ACE method. We know that the atomic number is equal to the proton number, which is equal to the electron number. Seven protons, then seven electrons. This takes us to mass number. Most of an atom's mass, remember Rutherford told us this, is concentrated in its nucleus and depends on the number of protons and neutrons. The weight of the electrons are so small, about one two thousandth that of a proton, that we can essentially ignore them for determining the atom's mass. So virtually all of the mass is determined by the number of protons and neutrons combined. And remember, they both weigh about the same. So the mass number is simply proton number plus neutron number. So back to our thing, right? Let's look at helium. Atomic number two, two protons, two neutrons. Together, these give us a mass number of four. Look at lithium. Three protons, four neutrons, mass number of seven. Okay, so the mass number is the total of protons plus neutrons. Bonus, if, if you're given the, the mass number, and you already know the atomic number, you can take the mass number minus the atomic number, which is protons, and the remaining number must be the number of neutrons. So if I tell you that fluorine has a mass of 19, and you look it up and you say, oh, it's atomic number 9, it must have 10 neutrons. 19 minus 9 leaves 10 neutrons. So the number of neutrons equals the mass number less the atomic number which is the same as the number of protons. Okay, so now we look at this and we can, we can decode all, all the parts of it. Here's the chemical symbol. Here's the element's name, oxygen. Here's its atomic number. And here's its atomic mass. And from this, we can conclude, hey, if the total of the protons and the neutrons equals 16, there must be eight neutrons in addition to the eight protons. Let's look at gold. Gold has essentially an atomic mass of 197, has an atomic number of 97, which is the number of protons. So if we take 
197 minus 79, you will get the number of neutrons, which is 118 neutrons. Okay, so this is sample problem 5.2. Same thing. How many protons, electrons, and neutrons are in the following atoms? Okay, beryllium is atomic number 4. It means 4 protons, 4 electrons. Mass number 9, 9 minus 4, 5 neutrons. Okay, 10 protons, 10 electrons. 10, no, I'm sorry, 20 minus 10 uh, gives us the number of neutrons, 10 neutrons. 11 protons, 11 electrons. Mass number 23, 23 minus 11 gives you 12 neutrons. Now this takes us to the concept of isotopes because here's another area where Dalton turned out to be not quite right. It turns out that not all atoms are the same. Atoms of the same element can be slightly different. Now remember, what determines the essential identity of an atom is its proton count. So atoms can have, atoms that are the same have the same number of protons, but atoms with the same number of protons can have different numbers of neutrons, and that means it's going to change its atomic mass slightly. So that's the definition of an isotope, not the, not the, the minor team in Albuquerque, New Mexico, but elements that have the same number of protons but a different number of neutrons. Look, for example, at this. This is, heli this is neon 20, neon 21, and neon 22. So this, is, this means this is the atomic mass in this case. So this is neon. It has an atomic number 10, which means 10 protons. And in this case, it's got to have 10 neutrons to get us to the total mass of 20. But look at this one. This also has 10 protons because it's neon, but it has 11 neutrons. And this one, 10 protons because it's neon, but now 12 protons. So you can have three different kinds of neon. Neon 20, neon 21, and neon 22. And we can find out how abundant each isotope of neon is. So it turns out that neon 20 makes up about 90% of all neon. This just makes up a fraction, and this is around 9%. We also find different isotopes of carbon, for example. Everyone's heard of carbon-12. That's the normal form of carbon. It makes up almost 99% of carbon. Six protons, six neutrons, that's carbon-12. But you can also have carbon-13, six protons, seven neutrons. You can also have carbon-14, six protons, eight neutrons. Carbon-14 is what they use for certain kinds of dating. You may have heard of carbon-14 dating. Well, here's the takeaway. Despite these differences in uh, neutron count, isotopes are still chemically alike. Because they have the same number of protons, that's what gives it its identity, and a matching number of electrons. And it turns out that it's the electrons that are responsible for the chemical behavior. So you can vary the number of neutrons, and it still behaves chemically the same as every other um, element with the same number of protons. Sample problem. Two isotopes of carbon are carbon-12 and carbon-13. Let's write the symbol for each isotope using superscripts and subscripts to represent the mass number and the atomic number. Well, as you can see down here, the way we would write carbon-12 is we would put carbon and we would put the atomic number down here and then the mass number here. Carbon-13 would be written here, same way, carbon, the symbol, atomic number, 6, mass number, 13. Now that takes us to the topic of atomic mass, which, as we already alluded to, right, that the mass of a proton or a neutron, which are in the nucleus, is very, very small. The actual mass is 1.7 times 10 to the negative 24, which is an astonishingly small number way too small to use practically. So we have to compare it to something uh, of, of a similar size using a reference isotope. We want to get the relative mass of atoms. So we have to pick something to be our reference standard. So let's choose good old-fashioned carbon-12. It's everywhere. Uh, we are a carbon-based life form, so carbon is, is all around us. Let's assign carbon-12 a weight of exactly 12 atomic mass units. Let's see what those are. 
those atomic mass units are going to represent the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. We know that carbon has six of each, so for a total of 12 things in its nucleus, protons and neutrons. So we're going to define atomic mass unit as one twelfth of the mass of a carbon 12 atom. Right, that just becomes our reference standard. Just like we got to say, okay, this is going to be our yardstick, or this is going to be our meter. This is going to be the reference weight for all of our other atoms. And it's one twelfth of the mass of a carbon 12 atom. So that means each proton and each neutron is about one AMU, one atomic mass unit. So let's just look at our subatomic particles, how we represent them. Electrons are represented with the symbol E with a little negative for the negative charge. And so we say it has a relative negative charge of negative one. Again, we're just using that as a reference. This is the, the unit of charge. Its relative mass compared to one twelfth of the weight of a carbon-14 atom is super tiny. Okay. Where does it live? It goes around the nucleus. Proton, we use a small p with a plus to indicate the relative plus one positive charge. Its relative mass is essentially one AMU. A neutron, we use an N with a zero to indicate a neutral charge. It has no relative electric charge. Again, same relative mass as the proton, and these both live in the nucleus. So from this, you might predict that the atomic mass of every element would be some whole number right? Just the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. But we saw that wasn't quite true, especially when we looked at gold, and it was almost 197, but it, was, it was, wasn't quite the whole number. And this is true for a lot of elements. Why? Look at this one. Look at chlorine. Chlorine has atomic number 17. So you would expect it when you added up the 17 protons, and it looks like here uh, around 18 neutrons that you should get some whole number well, you don't have half neutrons you don't have half protons where are we getting this this decimal from right that's kind of weird how do we explain this well it's because of the relative abundance of the naturally occurring isotopes remember we saw before that isotopes can have different weights they're the same number of protons but different number of neutrons and that gives them different numbers of atomic mass. So if we look at the relative abundance of some isotopes, of the isotopes of some elements, here's what we see. So hydrogen comes in three different varieties, hydrogen 1, hydrogen 2, and hydrogen 3. It turns out that most of the hydrogen in our, in our, on, on Earth turns, is, is, uh, is hydrogen 1, but there's still a small amount of this other. So that doesn't, the, 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 these are so small that it doesn't really change the average atomic mass too much from just hydrogen one. As you can see, it's maybe a tiny bit higher than the amount for this. But look at something like chlorine. Chlorine has two isotopes, chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. And it turns out 75% is of uh, chlorine is found as chlorine 35, but 25% is found as this heavier chlorine 37. So when you do the weighted average, look at the see that the, the, the mass of this is right around 35, as you'd expect. The mass of this is right around 37. But when you take 75% at this weight and 25% at this weight, you get a weighted average that is not close to a whole number. So that's why when you look on a periodic table and you see these atomic masses, this is why they are not neat whole numbers made up of an exact count of protons and neutrons like you'd expect. It's because we're taking the weighted average of these different masses, these different isotopes. So lots of ways to calculate it and, and we'll see it's just like calculating your grades. You take the weighted average of the naturally occurring samples of the element. So let's do a problem like that. Um, which isotope of copper is more abundant? Copper 63 or copper 65? The atomic mass of, and that means the, the weighted average, as we find it on the periodic table, is around 63.5. So we have to ask ourselves, 
which of these is more abundant? Well, we know if it's an average, it's going to be a number between 63, the lightest, and 65, the heaviest. If it were 99.9% .9 copper 65, the atomic mass would be close to 65, it would be 64.9 or something like that. If it was 99.9% .9 copper 63, the atomic mass would be closer to 63. We see that it's 63.5. So it's closer to copper 63 than it is to copper 65, which would lead us to conclude quite properly that copper 63 is the more abundant isotope because that because the atomic mass is closer to the mass of carbon 63. Here's another sample problem. Element X has two natural isotopes. The isotope with this mass has a relative abundance of 19%. The isotope with this mass heavier, has a relative abundance of 80%. Calculate the atomic mass of this element. So we're going to, have to calculate the relative uh, uh, weighted average, the weighted average of these two weights. So we're going to, we're going to basically say we're going to take 19% times this number plus 80% times this number to give us the weighted average of that element. And so when we do that, again, we just turn 19% into 0.1999. We turn this percentage into a decimal point, and then we just take the weight times the, 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 the percentage, and then this weight times this percentage, and we add them together, and that gives us the weighted average. Does this make sense? Yeah, the calculated value is closer to the more abundant isotope, the heavier one, so it's pushing toward 11, as you would expect if 80% of it is at this heavier weight. All right, how do we organize the elements? How do we arrange them in a logical sequence? And this takes us to one of the most incredible intellectual achievements in human history, the invention of the periodic table. So there's around 100 known elements. How do we arrange them? Well, there's a guy named Mendeleev, and there's a great video called Crash Course on YouTube that describes his personal life. It's an incredible tale. But the bottom line is, is that this Russian chemist, Dmitry Mendeleev, uh, was messing around and trying and spent just he spent a lot of time thinking about and arranging, trying to arrange these elements in some sort of systematic fashion. And as you can see, he began to line them up. Uh, and so we'll see, we'll see what he did here. He listed the elements in columns in order of increasing atomic mass. So they knew the weight of each of these elements. So he just listed them in, in order of increasing weight. But then he arranged the columns so that the elements with the most similar properties were side by side. So this is what it would look like. So he's arranging them by weight, right? But he's, he puts carbon next to silicone because they have very similar properties. He puts oxygen next to sulfur because they too have very similar properties. He puts fluorine next to chlorine next to bromine, next to iodine, because they have very similar properties. So he's beginning to, to arrange them by weight, but in columns where the similarly, uh, similarly property elements are together. And notice here, he leaves holes for unknown elements, saying, you know what? We don't know what belongs here, but there's something of, of about this weight that fits in that slot, something between zinc and it's going to be similar in its properties to aluminum. So he actually left spaces um, for, for predicted as yet undiscovered elements. And it turns out that he was able to predict the actual physical and chemical properties of many of the elements um, before they were discovered. And, and those discoveries confirmed his predictions. In 1913, a British physicist named Moseley determined the atomic number of the atoms. So before this, again, they, they didn't have the proton figured out. Um, but Moseley, he was able to x-ray uh, the nucleus and determine the atomic number, the proton count. And so rather than ranging everything simply by weight, he arranged them by increasing proton count. And that was, that was, this, I mean, that was a slight difference, remember, Mendeleev arranged them in order of mass, 
And that is the way that the modern periodic table is arranged today. If you want to remember the difference, Mendeleev ordered them by atomic mass. The new guy ordered them by atomic number. Mendeleev mass, new guy number. And that's the way we have the table today. And so this is what it looks like. And this is, as I mentioned, an astonishing intellectual achievement. This is one of the most important tools that a chemist has to organize and arrange all of the known elements that make up the material universe in a systematic, uh, predictive way. This is the long form of the periodic table because these elements here, we're going to find out they're called the inner transition elements. They actually fit right here, but if you put them in, it makes this super, super long version of the periodic table, which is kind of hard to reproduce, and so we typically see it like this. But realize that these, this long double row here, fits right here and would push all of these to the right quite a ways. There are alternate ways to arrange the table. I'll just give you some quick. But let's get back to the way we typically see and use the modern periodic table. As I mentioned, it's one of the most important tools in the chemist's toolbox. It is a, the Bible of the natural world. Just like the Bible contains God's supernatural revelation, the periodic table contains what we know about the natural composition and the natural structure and the repeating order found among the natural elements. So we're going to look at how to read and decode and, and understand and appreciate the various parts of this incredible compilation known as the periodic table. So the first thing you're going to see is that the horizontal rows are known as periods. So when we read from left to right, that's period one. Here's period two. Here's period three. And, and these, just, these just stack right on top of each other. So once we go to the end of period one, we wrap around to period two. So, so element three, atomic number three, is right next to helium, even though I you know, can't stack it that way. I, mean, I could, but it would just be one long ribbon at that point. Um, and then when we get to, a, to 10, we're going to wrap around to a, a, a new period starting with 11. So periods are these horizontal rows, and as we're going to see, groups are the vertical rows. Properties will vary as we move across the period. So as we go across period one, right, hydrogen and helium vary. Lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon. These all have very, very different chemical properties, but when we go back and start to repeat, sodium has very similar properties to lithium, and magnesium has very similar properties to beryllium, and aluminum has very similar properties to boron, silicone to carbon, phosphorus to nitrogen, and so on, sulfur to oxygen, chlorine to fluorine, argon to neon, and you begin to have this repeating pattern of elements that are similar to the ones above and below them. So what we see is we have variation across a period, but similarity down a group. And that pattern repeats at the next period and creates that similarity down the group, as we're going to see. This gives rise to what is known as the periodic law. When we arrange elements in order of increasing atomic number, there is a periodic repetition of both their physical and their chemical. That means elements with similar chemical and physical properties wind up in the same column of the periodic table. So everything in this column, well, with the exception of hydrogen, but all of these metals have extremely similar chemical properties, as do all of these metals, okay? as do all of these halogens, as do all of these noble gases, and so on. As I mentioned, every vertical column is called a group. Every group is identified by a number and a letter, either A or B. And so what we're going to see, this is column 1A, column 2A. Okay, all of these are going to be Bs. I'm going to jump back over here to 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, and 8A, also sometimes called group 0. So these, these groups in green are known as the A groups. What do you think the rest of them are called? 
duh, they're going to be called the B group. All right, so here's the A group in green. Here's the B group in blue. And as you can see, so here's 3B, 4B, 5B, uh, all the way down. Now, the A group in green is also known as the main group. I'll do it in green here again. All of these green ones are the main group. This is group A, 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, and 8A, or 0. Um, there, there are other, you'll see other numbering schemes, but don't worry, we can translate those. Um, but these are the main group, and the reason they call the main group is they exhibit all of the main characteristics that we find in the periodic table. So they start over here as, as metals, and then come over here to metalloids and then they become nonmetals. Finally they become noble gases. So the, the main group, also called the representative group, represents all the different kinds of elements that we find in the natural world. So these are groups 1A through 7A, including group 8A or group 0. All right, now here the main group is represented now here in blue. All right, now that's the main group. So what about the, what's the rest of this called? Well, the rest of this is called the B group. And these are called the transition. This group in green is called the transition metals. These are all metals. They're not representative. So we have the main group includes metals, metalloids, nonmetals, gases, liquids, solids. But these are all essentially metals. These are all metals. There's no nonmetals in there. So these don't vary. They, they don't represent the, the vast range of differences. And this group here, which is really a subgroup of the transition metals, are known as the inner transition metals. So we can classify all these three broad groups of the periodic table. The main group, the transition metals, and the inner transition metals. As I mentioned, the representative group elements are called that because they exhibit the entire range of physical and chemical properties. We can divide those representative elements into three subcategories. So again, we're dividing the main group, group A, representative elements, into three other categories. So don't worry about this inner group here, which are also metals, but the main group has metals on this side. Groups one and two are essentially metals. And then these other groups are a mix of metals, metalloids, which are kind of, they, they, they're an in-between group, they have some metal characteristics and some non-metal characteristics, and then all of these non-metals in the upper right. So those are the three basic subcategories of the entire periodic table and of group A. Metals, non-metals, and metalloids. Metals, they are electrically conductive, right? They conduct electricity. They also conduct heat. They are shiny. They can be drawn into a wire. The fancy name for that is ductility. They are malleable. You can bang on them and deform them. Two important groups are the alkali metals and the alkali earth metals. And they are found in this group here, group one, with the exception of hydrogen, and group two. I have a video here that basically just shows the reactivity of these metals with water. It's very explosive. Most non-group A elements are also metal. So basically all of the group B uh, are metal. So this, these transition metals are metal, and then these inner transition elements are metals. So those are all the Bs. And remember, this inner transition fits right in here inside these transition elements. Approximately 80% of all elements are metal. It's the most common elemental form. So if you look, here are metals all the way up to this particular line where you have some metalloids, which have characteristics of both metals and nonmetals, and then all of our nonmetals. Uh, this should be colored yellow. This is also a nonmetal. Uh, here's a better picture where hydrogen is indeed classified as a nonmetal. As I mentioned, the upper right corner of the table, these are the nonmetals. They're non shiny, non conductors. Of this group, one important group is group seven, the halogens. 
this includes these very reactive uh, group 7, chlorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. They form lots of compounds, and they, like, they form lots of compounds over here with some of these metallic elements. Group 0 or group 8 are the noble gases, and these are significant because they show very little tendency to react chemically with anything. The heavy stair-step line that divides metals from non-metals right here is uh, frequented on both sides, or at least periodically here with the metalloids. And so these are important groups. This is a, these are often semiconductors. Uh, that's why silicon, for example, is used in computers. It has it's, it's, it's carbon is a non-conductor, aluminum is a great conductor, and this is a semiconductor. So that property is useful for many electronic things. So these are metalloids, as I mentioned, share properties of both. <clears throat> it's again another breakdown of the three basic categories of elements. So our key concepts in this chapter are atoms are the building blocks of matter. All elements have different atoms, and that is their identity is determined by the number of protons they have. There are three subatomic particles, protons, electrons, and neutrons. And a neutral atom, protons equal electrons. And the mass is contained in the nucleus, which is com comprised of the neutrons and the protons, the electrons, uh, who make a, a, a orbital cloud around the outside. proton number equals the atomic number, which also equals the electron number. If we add the protons and the neutrons together, we get the mass number of each atom. Isotopes have the same number of protons, but different numbers of neutrons, and thus different mass numbers. Remember, we define atomic mass, or AMU, as one twelfth of the mass of the carbon-12 atom. The atomic masses, as found in the periodic table, are the weighted average of all the isotopes. The periodic table is a stunning intellectual achievement that helps organize all the elements. The groups are the vertical columns, and things in the same group have similar chemical properties. The, row, or the, the, uh, uh, yeah, the rows are the horizontal, uh, atomic columns are horizontal rows, and they are listed in order of increasing atomic number. Mendeleev did it by increasing mass, but Mosley put them in the order of increasing atomic number. And the uh, so basic subgroups are metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. And that's it.